open to James, the first book most likely written in the New Testament. And we are going to start this morning a study of what you might call classic Christianity, what Christianity in the church was like before all the additives, before all the traditions kind of swept in. A lot of things that we think always were in the church really weren't. Uh, maybe we call it pioneer Christianity. Back when, when it was just unfettered and it was hard and it was glorious. But the book of James is a, a wonderful book. And this morning I'd like to introduce to you in a, in a different way. In fact, uh, we're only going to look at the first few words. And I want you to just follow along as I read them. James, a servant of God. That's all the further we'll get, but I hope that it really deeply is impressed on your heart who James was and how he came to be a servant of God. And to do that, I would like to start this study by doing a, a little personal interview with James. In fact, I spent a long time these last few weeks reading and reading and reading and reading everything about his life and about where he shows up in the scripture record and about what his background would have been like. And from that, I distilled down a personal first-person account from him. Just imagine that, that James from this book, James from the Bible, came this morning and gave his testimony, much like we have uh, testimonies for membership, testimonies for different ministries. And listen, and I, I'm trying to say this long enough so you catch what I'm doing so you can just kind of follow him as he talks about how he came to Christ. Let's listen to James as he talks to us this morning. Good morning, my brethren in Christ Jesus, our exalted Lord and King. My name is James. I am a servant of God and of my big brother while he was here on earth, Jesus Christ. I was not always such a follower of Christ. Let me tell you briefly my story this morning. I grew up in a devout Jewish home with a saintly mom, a sickly dad. He died when I was still young. Three brothers, two sisters, and a perfect half-brother. What a difficult thing it was to live with the Son of God. I never got along well with my oldest brother. He was always right. He was never wrong. He was never bad. He was never mischievous nor impatient. He never would argue with us. He would never stew. He wouldn't fight. Rather, he was kind and humble, always generous and hardworking. You know, he seemed to never sleep. Whether or not he worked late in Dad's carpentry shop, he always was up before the rest of the family. In fact, he would come in just before breakfast every morning from outside, and as we sat there, we could tell he had been out there quite a while. Mother would always just look at him. She had such wistful and wonder-filled eyes when she looked at him. When he spoke, which was seldom compared to us, whose words just filled that little house in Nazareth, as we would sit around the table so well made by Jesus, my big brother, his words seemed to sweep all of us along. He always was so amazing. He was saying things that would defy explanation. He was profound, and yet we understood every word. All of us boys would leave the table saying, yeah, that's just what I would have said, although we could not resist his wisdom. We hated his words. The older we got, they seemed to pierce our souls. They irritated us to the bone. I can remember the last day he was home. It was the day that the small door leading to the carpenter shop closed for the last time. Gone would be the hours of wonder-filled talks that the local folks had come to so enjoy with the kindest man all of them had ever met. No more would the wide eyes of children be seen looking wistfully off as his stories from the scriptures, stories of David and Elijah and Moses, seemed to come alive. When he taught, it was just like to all of us that he had been there, that, that he had witnessed those events himself. He seemed to know the heroes of our faith personally. But I remember that day when our meek and lowly carpenter brother headed toward the Jordan. He had to wind his way through the crowds. Our cousin John the Baptist was preaching at the river's edge to people who had gathered from all over the land. 
a group of scowling Pharisees were standing off to the side as the Baptist's fiery words aimed at them told them of their utter viper-like lack of contrition. That would exclude them from his baptism of repentance. Looking back at the crowds, John was struck by the serenity of one who confidently strode to the water's edge. As he looked into the eyes of my brother, he experienced what we had experienced growing up with him. For John the Baptist, it was the first time in any man that he had seen such purity, such holiness, and a living truth. To us who watched, it was almost funny. Immediately, the same lips of the Baptist who had denied the wicked and proud Pharisees now cowering in the distance, those same lips were disqualifying himself. In the presence of Jesus, John saw his own sinfulness. But after a protest, John the Baptist yielded to his master. That day, he baptized the Christ. After Jesus was baptized, it seemed to thunder or something. All of us knew it was really unusual. And my brother Jesus was never really the same. Looking into the distance, he headed straight out from the river into the barren rocks of the Judean wilderness desert. He just disappeared. It was over a month that he was gone. It was like his life at our hometown and in his little carpenter shop was done. We all wondered why he'd left mom alone. When he finally did return, we picked on him mercilessly because he was still home with mom and we had all fallen in love with our childhood sweethearts. He had never dated. He never even looked with anything but kindness and respect upon women. Many would have longed for such a man as him as a husband, but with his work supporting mom and those strange early morning walks he did every day, marriage never seemed to be an option. You know, those early walks Jesus always had when I grew up at home intrigued me and my brothers. We even used to try and find him. Once we did. I'll never forget that morning. When he came up on Jesus, he was looking straight up in the sky, and he was talking in such a wonderful way to someone we couldn't see. He called him Father. We figured he must really have missed Joseph or something like that. After that, we never really tried to find him out there again. But back to that last day he was at home, we hounded him to go to the feast at Jerusalem and show himself if he were some prophet or something. And you know what? He did. He started to walk through the land up and down. Soon crowds in the hundreds followed him, then into the thousands. And finally, I'm told, tens of thousands followed him, hanging on every word. We are told that He had fed them all from a tiny lunch basket. I heard stories that he had healed blind and crippled folks and a lot more, but we didn't believe it. You know, stories have a way of growing. Stories about Jesus, my big brother, were legendary. Well, time flew by, three years or more. I was married. We had our first child, and it was in there sometime that Jesus came home to speak to his hometown crowd in Nazareth. None of us ever moved very far away from Mary, our mother. We just stayed right there. We worked in Nazareth. And when he first came back, everyone loved him again, just like when he was in the carpenter shop. It was kind of neat to have all the town excited that my strange brother was coming. Well, all that changed quickly. You see, after they invited him to the synagogue and handed him the scroll, he read from the scriptures. And then he began to speak to us as if he had written those words. We all became quite uncomfortable. There were murmurs. And finally, some of the less inhibited of town jumped up. They actually grabbed Jesus and in a frenzy of rage, half dragged and half carried him up to the edge. You see, our hometown of Nazareth is really small. Two things of note. We had a wonderful spring-fed well, and we were built on the edge of a cliff that falls so far down, we were warned to never get near it. They were going to kill him. My brother. I couldn't help myself. I cried out, stop! But their fury was unstoppable. And then it happened right there before my very eyes. He turned and serenely looked at me with eyes of sadness. 
And then he just kind of evaporated. The mob was shocked. I ran to tell Mom. And what do you think I saw? It was him off in the distance, walking far down the road, headed to Capernaum. I couldn't shake that sermon, he said, or the strange power he wielded so gently. So I decided I'd start following him at a distance. Now, I was never like one of those hot-headed fishermen, James and John, or the others, Peter and Andrew. No, I wasn't going to be a disciple. It was a few weeks later, just before the Passover. Mom said she had to go to Jerusalem. I couldn't let her walk all the way down there alone, so I left my wife and little ones with the family, and I set out with Mom. Interestingly, my younger brother Jude said he wanted to come too. Mom said we had to hurry because something awful was happening. She said Jesus told her that he was going to die. Well, the rest is unforgettably etched upon my soul. Each step along that hard-packed path of the hillsides and then all the way up to Jerusalem were filled with sights and sounds of my brother. It all was starting to fit. You know, Dad's stories to us about angels and wise men following a, a bright star and then those shepherds who saw lights and, and they listened to angels. And then Dad always talked about Mom's first child. Joseph had always spoken to Jesus differently. He never talked to him like a son. He almost seemed to be his best friend. And then he told us that temple story when Jesus was 12 and, and knew more than all the leaders in the temple. And then... We remember at the baptism, Cousin John was pointing at Jesus and shouting that he was the Lamb of God. And now Mom was saying he was going to die at Passover? Well, we arrived in time to see it all. He was in Jerusalem still preaching. The religious leaders hatefully attacked him. But he so skillfully put them down with his words. But then it happened. I saw him bound by the Romans, looked as if he had been horribly beaten, and now he staggered through the streets. They used that dreaded death machine on him. He was crucified. I can still see him bleeding and gasping for air. I watched it all. It seems to run through my soul all the time. But let me finish. I'm no longer his little brother. You see, it was there at the cross that I too believed. After he rose, the scriptures record that he appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the apostles, but then he appeared to James. That's me. I am now James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've just met James. There are four men named James in the New Testament. The one that wrote the book that we're going to study this morning, the book of James, was the brother of Jesus. As Mark chapter 6 and verse 3 says, he was one of four brothers and two sisters who rose to the challenge of Christ. James himself became the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He is profiled in Acts chapter 12 and 15 and 21. The Apostle Paul speaks of him in Galatians chapter 2. And in this short letter that you hold before you this morning, he writes 108 verses, and in those 108 verses are no less than 50 direct commands to Christians. As he writes, he addresses his comments to the believers who have left Jerusalem because of Paul's persecution. These believers are called brethren and beloved. James reflects a good grasp of the Old Testament scriptures. He refers to all the books of the Pentateuch, he frequently alludes to Joshua and 1 Kings, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and at least seven of the minor 12 prophets. James truly reflected the Sermon on the Mount. Although he never quotes it, it seems like a reminiscence of a special time when he heard his brother speak. As we look at this book, I ask you a question. Do you want to grow in your spiritual life? You want to grow in classic Christianity? Listen to what this book talks about. It talks about confession of sin. It talks about how to have a prayer life that gets in touch with God. It talks about wealth, when it's right and when it's wrong. 
It leads us through the difficulty of temptation. It tells us about using our mouth, not for swearing, not for murmuring. It teaches us how to have godly patience and to not judge people by what they look like. It speaks about what it means to submit to God and how to avoid worldliness. It speaks about how strife begins in our life. And whether we're rich or poor, how we can have wisdom and joy in trials. It tells us to avoid earthly wisdom and to seek heavenly wisdom. It talks about how to have our tongues in line with God. And it speaks about how if we are going to teach what God expects, it tells the true role of faith and works and how we can be justified with God and what his law is and how we can live in liberty. It speaks to us of impartiality, of true worship of God and of how our hearts can be regenerated. I'd like to walk you through this book. Starting in chapter 1, verse 2, the writer James says these precious words, that we should find a faith that endures under trials. Look at verse 2. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. Faith will endure trials, he says, down through verse 8, and we'll study that at a future time. Starting... A little bit later, down there in verse 12, he says that faith will understand and overcome temptations. Because it says in verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. And when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, whom the Lord hath promised to those who love him. And when you're tempted, don't be troubled, because God will deliver us from that temptation as we look to him. Looking in verse 19, it says this, You know, beloved, that we should be swift to hear and slow to speak. Why is that? Because we should, verse 21, put aside filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and receive the word implanted. James teaches us that faith is receiving the true word and letting it get implanted in our hearts. Chapter 2, we'll see as we study this that faith is seeing like Jesus sees. He sees impartially. And starting in verse 14 of chapter 2, faith is living like Jesus lived, doing good. And in chapter 3, the first half of the chapter tells us how to control our tongues. And it says that we should know our tongue is like a fire, and we should keep it under control. In the last part of chapter 3, when we walk by faith, we receive wisdom from above. And truly it says in verse 17 that, of chapter 3 that when we are in tune with God, the wisdom from above that comes on our life is pure and peaceable and gentle, and reasonable, and full of mercy, and good fruits. It's unwavering and without hypocrisy. And faith, in chapter 4, is separating from the world and submitting to God. And finally, in chapter 5, faith is patiently waiting for Christ's timing in our lives. Well, that's just a brief introduction to the book. James had looked at Christ had considered the hardness of his heart and had turned in faith to the one he couldn't resist and bowed to him as his Lord, and he became Christ's servant. I hope this morning that we are servants of Christ. <laughs>